This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Seventeen-year-old Tracy Kirkpatrick was an honor student with a passion for poetry. In 1989, Tracy was stabbed to death in the clothing store where she worked. Three months later, a man claiming to be the killer made this bizarre telephone call. I know this is going to sound surprising, but three months ago, I stabbed a girl to death. Perhaps you can help catch him. Folsom Prison, California. For years, he was thought to be virtually escape proof. But in 1984, a convicted killer, Steve Wilson, pulled off an ingenious jailbreak and became the first man to escape from Folsom in 15 years. In 1943, 22-year-old Frankie Bloomer was reported missing in action when the destroyer USS Rowan was sunk in battle. A few days later, Frankie's picture, taken on a hospital ship, appeared in the newspaper. For almost 50 years, his family has been asking, what happened to Frankie Bloomer? In 1965, 22-year-old Judith Hyams vanished without a trace from Coral Gables, Florida. 25 years later, in a bizarre turn of events, a series of anonymous phone calls claim that Judith is still alive. Also, we'll bring you an intriguing update on our story of Amelia Earhart, the legendary aviator who disappeared while flying around the world in 1937. Recently, an expedition found a piece of equipment which may have been on her plane. Join me this fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Tracy Kirkpatrick was an introspective, pretty teenager from a small town near Frederick, Maryland. The third of four children, Tracy was an honor student who loved reading and writing poetry. In early 1989, Tracy read her family a haunting poem written by Christina Rossetti. Tracy seemed to be asking them not to grieve for her when she was gone. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land when you can no more hold me by the hand. Her and her boyfriend had just recently broke up, and I guess she expressed her feelings through her, her writing. She wrote a lot of uh, lon lonely poems. She's very intelligent. She's a hard worker, and she loved people, and she loved to be around people, and she loved to have a lot of friends and everything. Now this is our new spring line. We have it in blue. During Tracy's senior year in high school, she held down two part-time jobs, one of them a sales clerk in a woman's clothing store. On the night of March 15, 1989, Tracy was assigned to close the store and tally up the day's receipts. 15 minutes before closing time, Tracy was alone. It was 8.45 p.m. Two hours later, a shopping mall security guard noticed that the lights inside the women's clothing store were still on. The front door was unlocked. The guard called out but received no response. He walked toward the back of the store. In a storage room, he found Tracy Kirkpatrick's lifeless body. The guard immediately uh, notified the police. The store. I, you better send someone down right away, all right? The store ends. The store At almost the same moment, Billy and Diane Kirkpatrick, Tracy's parents, were en route to the shopping mall. It was nearly 11 p.m., more than an hour after Tracy usually returned home. I'm worried for nothing. Okay, I know everything's gonna right. be fine. 
Uh-oh. What the hell is this? What is... Look, there's police cars, Bill. Yeah, okay. Okay, All right. oh my God. As soon as I seen it was at the store, I jumped out of the car. And uh, I went up to the door, and they wasn't... They didn't want to let us in at first because they really didn't know who we were. Okay, Tracy works here. All right, hold on. Chief, your parents. Thank you. Yeah. Is she okay? I said, is she all right? Can I see her? And when he shook his head, no, I just blocked out everything. I didn't want to hear the rest of what was going, going to be said to me. No. All right. Bill. Oh, okay. Oh, Diane, sit down. Just what no. did someone have in, in, against her that they would do something like that to her? She never did anything to hurt anybody. Police could find no apparent motive for Tracy Kirkpatrick's brutal murder. There was no sign of sexual assault. The day's cash receipts had been left untouched on the counter. Since there were no indications of a struggle, police believed the murder must have been someone Tracy knew. A thorough analysis of the crime scene turned up latent fingerprints, but no other physical evidence. The case was stalled. Then three months later, police got their first real lead when a mysterious telephone call was recorded by a nationwide confession hotline in Las Vegas. Hello, my name is Don, and I'm calling from Frederick, Maryland. This is a tape recording of the actual phone call. I know this is gonna sound surprising, but three months ago, I stabbed a girl to death. And you might think that in making this tape, I'm setting myself up to be caught, but there are a lot of guys named John in Frederick. The hotline immediately notified the Frederick police. The sincerity that I heard in that voice and the knowledge that the person was displaying, talking about what he had done, at that point convinced me that I probably was listening to the killer. Detective Horner thought the caller's knowledge of the case was convincing. He took the tape to his chief. Yes, sir. Uh, let's listen to it, then. The girl I killed was working in a lady's sportswear store. I often came by and talked to her when she was working alone. And one night when she was in the storeroom and we were talking, our conversation turned into an argument. And so I took out a knife that I have with me at all times, and I killed her. And uh, a few days later, I realized that I had created a lot of sadness. And I thought about turning myself into the police. But whatever they do to me, that won't bring Tracy back. So I decided that I better keep free, because we have the death penalty in Maryland. Uh, Thanks for listening. I'm sorry about what I did, but nothing can change it. Bye. Sure sounds like we have our killer, doesn't it? Sounds very authentic. They traced sure the does. call back to a supermarket in Walkersville, Maryland, which is uh, seven or eight miles just north of Frederick City. If it was the killer, he wanted to be caught, and he was seeking help uh, through this hotline. And it was a decision made by my chief of police and, and members of my division um, to compose a letter uh, to this individual and address it to Don and ask Don to please come forward. If he needed someone to talk to, I was available. The letter was published in a local newspaper on October 10th, 1989. Police received no response. But two weeks later, another unlikely phone call provided them with a new lead. Hello, my name is Sean, and I have rather an unusual request. How can I help you, Sean? On October 24th, Martha Woodworth, a Massachusetts woman with a reputation as a psychic, began to receive calls from a young man who identified himself as Sean. Well, I don't usually take cases like Sean that. seemed obsessed with finding the person who had murdered Tracy Kirkpatrick. Martha told Sean she needed more information before she could help. Eventually, he agreed to send Martha newspaper clippings. 
and when I received the envelope with his handwriting on the outside, I thought, this person has a much stronger involvement than just being a friend who's interested. I found the handwriting extremely disturbed, so I felt it was my responsibility to alert the police that I had a potential suspect for them. Martha, do you think you've talked to Sean enough that you could recognize his voice from a tape? Yes, I, I'm pretty sure. Okay, let me play a little of this tape for you on the telephone. Chief Ashton played the confession tape for Martha Woodworth. She believed the voice was Sean's. I knew it was Sean. In fact, my heart dropped. It was very chilling to hear the voice of the person I'd been speaking to for months actually confessing to the crime. You know, I certainly did encourage uh, her to uh, maintain contact with him. Because, uh, I mean, at that time, uh, we thought it was a viable lead and uh, it was the best lead that we had. And she was the you know, conduit between uh, Sean Don and the police department. What if the killer commits suicide? Police checked out the return address on Sean's envelope. It was in Walkersville, Maryland, the same town where the call-in confession had been made. However, the young man living at the address was not named Sean or Don. I think he was obsessed with that. Good morning. As requested by Frederick City At another police, dead end, the Frederick police turned to local radio stations for help. The caller claims to have killed Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick, who was brutally murdered in Frederick one year ago today. Authorities encourage you to listen carefully. There's a chance someone may recognize the caller's voice. After the tape aired, three people claimed they thought they recognized the voice. Again, the man was not named Sean or Don, but he was the young man who lived at the return address on the psychic's letter. Police searched his home the next day. Our hopes in serving the search and seizure warrant on his person obtaining physical evidence from that suspect was to send that material to our forensic lab and the state lab and uh, confirm our suspicions that he was, in fact, the person who committed this crime. Unfortunately, uh, the evidence was uh, examined and re-examined, and we were unable to confirm that he was either at the crime scene that night or had any, uh, any particular part in this uh, uh, criminal act. Okay, I guess. In the search, police found many newspaper clippings about Tracy's murder, but could find no evidence that the young man knew Tracy Kirkpatrick personally. He pled the Fifth Amendment and refused to answer any questions. There has to be someone that's seen something, someone coming from that store, running from that store, or leaving that store, or, or heard something. I just can't imagine something happening like that, no one knowing nothing about it. And the frustrating part is that, you know, we obviously know somebody killed her, and we've never been able to nail it down to the suspect that definitely did it. But, I mean, that has been our pledge to uh, the community and to the family that, you know, we're not going to give up until we do identify that person. On March 20th, 1989, Tracy Kirkpatrick was buried in Oak Grove Cemetery near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The poem she had once recited for her family was inscribed on her tombstone. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no more hold me by the hand. Yet if you should forget me for a while, and afterward remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that once I had, better by far that you should forget and smile and that you should remember and be sad. Six decades ago, famed aviator Amelia Earhart captured the heart and spirit of an entire generation with her courageous, record-breaking flights. But in 1937, 
Earhart became the subject of one of the most enduring and fascinating unsolved mysteries. On May 20th, 1937, Amelia and her navigator, Fred Noonan, began their attempt to circumnavigate the world in a twin-engine Lockheed Electra. They never returned. On July 2nd, they disappeared en route to the small South Pacific island of Howland. A massive search turned up no trace of Amelia, Fred, or their airplane. Years later, rumors surfaced that Earhart and Noonan were taken prisoner by the Japanese and held on the island of Saipan. This woman was brought ashore by the Japanese. Neva Blas has lived on Saipan her entire life. She claims that she witnessed Amelia Earhart's execution. Were Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan taken prisoner and executed on the island of Saipan? Or did their plane, in fact, go down in the vast and unforgiving waters of the South Pacific? Shortly after our broadcast, we learned of an intriguing discovery that may finally solve the mystery of Amelia Earhart's disappearance. In October of 1989, a 17-member expedition spent three weeks on a tiny, uninhabited island called Nikumaroro. Nikumaroro is 420 miles from Amelia's destination, Howland Island. The operation was headed by aviation archaeologist Rick Gillespie. No one ever really searched on that island for Amelia Earhart, although the U.S. Navy flew over it one week after she disappeared. The pilot in charge of the flight saw what he later described in his official report as clear signs of recent human habitation. What he could not have known at that time is there should have been no one on that island, no sign of any human activity on that island. The expedition found this aluminum aircraft part, which may have been installed in the Lockheed Electra by navigator Fred Noonan. The number on the box positively identifies it as a navigator's bookcase. We know there was a structure of this box's size and shape installed aboard the Earhart aircraft. Tests performed by the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. conclude that the bookcase came from a civilian aircraft and was manufactured in the years just prior to Earhart's disappearance. What the FBI has told us doesn't constitute proof. What it does is constitute sufficient evidence to merit a return to Nicomororo to find and photograph the ultimate proof, the airplane itself. Rick Gillespie and the archaeological team plan to return to Nicomororo. Using sonar and computer tracking devices, they will try to locate Amelia Earhart's plane in the waters just off the island. Perhaps, just perhaps, the mystery of the legendary Amelia Earhart will finally be solved. In 1976, a 30-year-old jack-of-all-trades named Steve Wilson showed up in Olancha, California. He was a licensed pilot and a certified electrician. He said he had come from San Diego, but never revealed much else about his past. With his rugged good looks and smooth-talking charm, Wilson soon made friends with the local residents. People liked Steve Wilson. He could tell you anything you wanted to hear and make you believe it. He was very much involved with the college. He liked to lift weights. He liked to weld. And when he was around a group of people that he enjoyed, he was very friendly and very uh, fun to be around. Wilson did occasional odd jobs on the Cabin Bar Ranch, a 900,000-acre spread 100 miles west of Death Valley. The ranch was owned by Bill Thornburg, a prominent horseman. 22-year-old Callie Thornburg lived at home and worked right alongside her father. When Steve Wilson met Callie, he took an immediate interest in her. They courted for nine months, and with Bill Thornburg's blessings, ran off to Reno to get married. Dad uh, wanted me to get married because he felt that I needed to have something other than him and the ranch. 
as we were driving to Reno or even the day before we left, I was wishing there was some way that I could get out of it or not get married, but um, I felt as though I had made that commitment and there was no way to get out of that. The marriage was an immediate disaster. Wilson was abusive and threatened Callie. Just two months after the wedding, Callie left her husband and moved back in with her father. Wilson was no longer welcome on the Cabin Bar Ranch. Hi, hon. A few days later, Callie told her father that Wilson had been making threatening phone calls. I didn't realize that guy was so crazy. I'm really afraid. I don't know what to do. Has the threats sparked a feud between Bill Thornburg and Steve Wilson. Well, I don't like to say this at all, Callie. But I really fear for your life. The guy's a nut. I know. Wilson would call on the phone and harass us. And he would say things like, I will hurt you worse than you've ever been hurt before. Uh, I will take everything you love away from you. You will pay. You will learn to love me. You will learn that loving me is easier than being away from me. About three weeks after the breakup, Steve Wilson showed up at the ranch to get Callie back. Kelly! Kelly, come out here! Kelly, I want to talk to you right now. Come out here. What do you want, Wilson? I want to talk to Kelly. She want to talk to you. Kelly, I love you. Well, she don't love you. It's over with. This between me and Kelly. Get off the ranch. Why are you doing this to me? Just go away! I love you, Kelly. Yeah, I'm out here. I'm telling you, Wilson, get off this ranch. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> I grabbed my dad and grabbed the gun and said, no, don't shoot him. It's not worth it. You know, I didn't want my father and Wilson to get into any kind of a confrontation with each other because I was afraid that Wilson would hurt my dad. May 29th, 1979. At 6 a.m., Bill Thornburg left the ranch house to do his morning chores and never returned. When I got there, he wasn't there. And so I waited for about, oh, 15 to 20 minutes, and he never showed. I thought something was wrong because he was always on time. Dad? And so I walked out to Dad. the water lines, and I found his truck with his every morning cup of coffee sitting on the dashboard, and it was still hot. Dad. Bill Thornburg was never seen again. Steve Wilson had also disappeared. Seven months passed. Then on Christmas Eve, 1979, a teenager riding his dirt bike through the desert, 45 miles south of the ranch house, made a grisly discovery. A teenage boy on a dirt bike had been over in the Sand Canyon area and had come across the skeletal remains of a, of a body. Uh, the boy knew his parents wouldn't believe him if he told them, so he, he actually took the head and rode back to his house. And at that time, his parents called the sheriff's office and they went out and investigated. Uh, with the evidence at the scene, the clothing, and different articles, it was immediately uh, known that it was Bill Thornburg's body. And the, all the evidence led to Steve Wilson. I believe he vented a lot of his rage at Bill up and to the point where he took him out and murdered him. Another year and a half passed, and Steve Wilson was still on the run. Then in 1981, he was spotted by a game warden in Kodiak, Alaska, and was subsequently arrested in Las Vegas. He pled guilty to first-degree murder and received a sentence of 25 years to life at Folsom Prison in California. Folsom Prison is a maximum security facility housing many violent killers. When Steve Wilson arrived, there had not been an escape in 15 years. Wilson immediately went to work, ingratiating himself to the officers and administrators. Mr. Martin, good morning to you, sir. How are you doing, Steve? Listen, a little favor I'd like to ask if you could help me out. He I joined the in-house work program and used his charm on those who could help him. I'd be a big help to you in the office. I'm much more down here sweeping up and stuff. Steve was a model prisoner. I have 30 years in his career of mine. 
And I would have to say that this guy is the greatest clerk I've ever had. Before long, Wilson became the clerk in charge of shipping. It is one of the most coveted inmate jobs in the prison, with the least supervision and the most freedom of movement. Hey, Larry. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Good. Hey, look, at invoice 1403. Only when he became a clerk in, in the warehouse up uh, adjacent to the metal factory and the license plate factory, but his job would entail him being in all different areas of the, uh, of the warehouse, picking up uh, inventories, picking up invoices, work orders. So for him to be in a certain area at any time would not be unusual, would not be significant. And if he wasn't there, would not be significant either. Two years passed. Prison officials had no idea that during that entire time, Wilson was plotting a way out. At 8.30 a.m. on August 3rd, 1984, while Wilson was working near the loading dock, he put his escape plan into effect. Hey! What is your problem? You ran into me. Listen, I told you about this safety last week. It was his fault. Watch it. When the truck was fully loaded, the officers sealed the door shut, unaware that Wilson had enlisted other inmates to create a diversion and help him make his escape. Wilson's meticulous planning had worked. Nobody noticed that he left the loading dock. It's my opinion that Steve Wilson was looking for the weakest link in our security to get out. I think he was planning this at least well over a year ahead of time. Uh, he was an intelligent individual, and uh, when you have vehicles going in and out of a secure area, that's your weakest link. The escape plan was modeled almost exactly after the last successful escape from Folsom in 1969, 15 years earlier. Authorities believe that as soon as a truck left the prison grounds, Wilson cut a hole in the roof using tin snips he had stolen from the prison metal shop. Just minutes later, the truck pulled into a local building. When the truck's driver went inside for a cup of coffee, Wilson squeezed through the hole he'd cut and disappeared. Having Wilson on the loose is very hard for me because I can never really relax. I don't like being alone. And I'm always looking around all the corners. I, I'm constantly in fear. Before Steve Wilson was sent to Folsom Prison, he was interviewed on videotape by a psychiatrist. I was thinking anything. I can't say that I was planning to kill him, that I wasn't planning to kill him or anything. I just turned in and drove straight to the grave. Who was driving him? Next, the poignant mystery of an American sailor whose ship was sunk by the Nazis. He was later photographed on a hospital ship and never seen again. Most of us are familiar with the heartbreaking stories of American soldiers still missing in action in Vietnam and the anguish and uncertainty their families face. It's astonishing to think that there are other families who've been carrying that same terrible burden ever since World War II. Yet along with that burden of despair comes a miracle of hope. This is a story of one American sailor's family and their steadfast dream of reunion. Frank Joseph Bloomer was born on October 12, 1921 in Ziegler, Illinois. The younger of two sons, he loved the outdoors, especially swimming and fishing. When World War II broke out, Frankie enlisted in the Navy against his parents' wishes. Frankie Bloomer served as a radio technician aboard the USS Rowan, a destroyer operating in the Mediterranean Sea. On September 11, 1943, just off the coast of Italy, a German U-boat targeted the Rowan. 
His torpedo hit home. Rowan sank in less than a minute. Two hundred and two American sailors were killed. Reported missing in action was 22-year-old radio man third class Frankie Bloomer. His parents heard that the Rowan was sunk on the, their car radio. In a short time, they were notified that it was missing in action. Incredibly, less than a week later, Mrs. Jane Bloomer saw a newspaper article with this photograph of three survivors of the USS Rowan. She recognized the man in the middle as her son, Frankie. I know this is him. Look. She immediately contacted her other son's wife, Dorothy. The two women compared the newspaper photograph with pictures of Frankie. Yes, see? I noticed that, too. Oh, it is him. When I first saw the newspaper picture of the three survivors, I was positive the one was Frankie. It had characteristics. He had features, and, and um, I knew it was Frankie. Jane Bloomer took the photographs to a local mortician who was an expert at photo identification. See how he's holding his arm there? Did he ever break his arm, maybe as a child? Yes, he did. I would say that these two men are absolutely the same. Are you sure? From my observation of this evidence, I definitely would conclude they're one and the same. Thank you. When the mortician told my mother-in-law that uh, he felt this picture was a Frankie, it gave her a lot more hope. She wrote to the American Red Cross to see if they could help her, and they said they got all of their information from the War Department, and that they could not find any information that she did not already have. Frankie's mother never stopped believing that her son was alive. When Mrs. Bloomer died in 1971, she passed her hope to a new generation, her granddaughter, Janie. As a very small girl, the first time I can remember hearing or, or finding out about my Uncle Frankie was at my grandma's house. I noticed the picture sitting on the mantel. I went over and I asked my grandma, I said, well, who is this? And she said, this is your Uncle Frankie. Why haven't I ever met him? Well, he went into the Navy a long time ago. He just hasn't come back yet, but I'm sure he will. I would say that my grandmother and grandfather lived with this haunting feeling of never knowing if he was alive or dead until the day they died. Also, I think my grandparents would commemorate Frankie's birthday in different ways from year to year. It never went forgotten. I can recall a time when um, we were over at my grandmother's house to eat dinner, and there happened to be a cake on the table, and, and I asked why there was a cake there, and she told me that it was because it was Frankie's birthday. Where is he? He's away just now. When is he going to be back? I don't know, Janie. I don't know. I'm searching to find the answer, whether he is alive or dead, so that I don't end up the same way that my grandparents did, because they both died not knowing the real truth of whether he was alive or dead. 12 years ago, Janie's parents erected a memorial headstone for Frankie. I do go to the grave occasionally, and our family is all buried in the same proximity. It's kind of strange, though, when, when I look at my Uncle Frankie's grave marker and know that he's not in there, and think of the possibility that he could be walking a street somewhere, yet there's a marker here with his name on it.
young woman to be pregnant and unmarried is nearly always a disturbing and unsettling prospect. In 1965, Judith Hyams, a 22-year-old medical technician from Coral Gables, Florida, found herself in that difficult predicament. With nowhere else to turn, Judith Hyams apparently decided to have an illegal abortion. It was a decision that probably led to her disappearance and quite possibly her death. Judith Himes learned she was pregnant in August of 1965. All right, if you'll just sign your name and address here. The name she gave her her pregnancy test was B. Kenny, evidence that she may have been trying to keep her condition a secret. Just walk down the hall and the first door to your right. Okay. Judy never said anything to me about the fact that she might have been pregnant. Uh, she never even told me that she went to have a test, a pregnancy test. Um, she called me, I guess the day that she was going to have the abortion, if that is what happened, uh, to tell me that she was going shopping. She was leaving work early and going shopping. The day she disappeared, Judith went to her bank and withdrew $300. She told her friends that she was going to buy a watch. Police believe that instead, Judith used the money for an illegal abortion. Uh, we were able to determine that she contacted a close friend of hers who uh, helped arrange an abortion through the suspect, uh, Dr. George Hodgson. And uh, through that, a date and time and a price were set for it. Judith made the arrangements to get the uh, money and uh, the last time she was seen, we feel that she was on her way to get this abortion. Get plenty of rest. You'll be fine in no time, huh? George Haju was a Hungarian immigrant who posed as an accredited physician. According to police, Haju operated an illegal abortion clinic in Coral Gables. Having an abortion, uh, I don't think she really had any other choice because nobody in those days would have a child and keep it. It just wasn't done. N not not in, in the group that she was friendly with. Julie? Judy. Judy. Right through here, huh? A lot of people have said that what happened to her was that she died having an abortion. Judy was a medical, a lab technician. She had a lot of medical knowledge. I find it hard to believe that she could have died having an abortion. Uh, I mean, surely she would have known she was intelligent enough to know to go for help someplace. Judith Himes disappeared on September 14th, 1965. Three weeks later, a rental car registered in her name was found 650 miles away in Atlanta, Georgia. On the back seat were traces of blood. Unfortunately, the car had sat there for two or three days before it was found. And then by the time we were able to conduct any crime scene on it, the car had been handled by other people, other police agencies. And by the time it got back to Dade County to be processed, whatever crime scene existed was totally ruined. A local resident had spotted a man in his 30s parking the vehicle. He removed what appeared to be a duffel bag from the trunk and then left the area. This man has never been identified. Three months later, George Haju was arrested for impersonating a physician. He jumped bail and has not been seen since. Perjury charges against him are still in the books, and police speculate he may know what happened to Judith Himes. Shortly after Haju's escape, police ended their investigation into Judith's disappearance. The Judith Himes case soon faded from local memory. But 25 years later, the investigation would be reopened thanks to a bizarre series of events that began with a police narcotics lecture in Nebraska. Captain Chuck Shear of the Coral Gables Police Department was unfamiliar with the Himes case. In 1990, Shear had a speaking engagement at the police academy 200 miles west of Omaha, Nebraska. The lecture itself was uneventful, and Shear returned home. It was then that he received a phone call from the past. 
Two days after the Nebraska lecture, Captain Shear received a long-distance phone call at his office in Coral Gables. Hello? Hello, is this Captain Shear? Yes, it is. What can I do for you? Well, my name is... The caller identified himself as Steve Brown, the host of a popular radio talk show in Omaha. He said an anonymous caller had given him information on the disappearance of Judith Himes. I told uh, Mr. Brown that I didn't, wasn't familiar with the case and I'd have to research and get back to him. I asked him for, for his phone number and if he knew how to get back in touch with this person that had called the radio talk show. He said yes, he did know how to get back to him and he gave me two phone numbers. A day later, Captain Shearer called Steve Brown in Nebraska. Steve Brown. He said, well, regarding your call to me, I have dug up the information that you needed and I have it for you. And I said, excuse me, because this is a call out of the blue. I didn't know who the man was or could not imagine what he was talking about. He was totally surprised, never heard of me, never knew anything about it, and denied adamantly that he was the one that made the phone calls. No, no. That's right. That's my home number. It's my private unlisted number. Where, who gave you that? When he gave me my own unlisted home phone number, I began to think through the people that come to mind who have that telephone number, thinking they could have called, and no one has yet come to mind who would make such a phone call without telling me about it, claiming to be me. Well, now I'm confused. I don't know what to, what to think. Why would, uh, why would a 25-year-old case surface all of a sudden out of Omaha, Nebraska, when in fact I've never been to Omaha, Nebraska in my life prior to this time, uh, and had no knowledge or anything about the case. I never mentioned the case whatsoever the whole time we were out there for the simple reason I really didn't even know about the case uh, to, to give anybody any information or anything. Good evening, Coral Gables Police Department. Captain Shear, one moment. Two days later, Captain Shear received another unusual phone call. Hello, Captain Shear. Judy Himes is alive and she lives in Omaha. Who is this, please? And she lives in Omaha. Who is this? Hello, who is this? My gut feeling is that something is going on to bring this case back up 25 years later. And it, it very possibly is that Judy is, in fact, living in, in the Omaha area. In the fall of 1989, an article on the Himes case appeared in a local newspaper. Captain Shear then received yet another anonymous phone call. Hello, Captain Shear. The third phone call that I received was from a man that identified himself as an informant for the FBI. Yeah, would you give me your name, please? He refused to give me his name at that time, but he said that he had just spent several weeks with Haju over in Budapest, Hungary, and he gave me the phone number. Uh, I contacted uh, uh, Interpol, and Interpol, th our Interpol through their uh, Budapest Interpol determined that the phone number that he gave me indeed comes back to the same name of the suspect at that time, the doctor that uh, supposedly performed the abortion. Police have yet to locate George Haju in Hungary, but they feel it is highly unlikely that he was responsible for the phone calls. The only real evidence that Judith is still alive has come from the mysterious phone calls. Hello, my name is Steve Brown. I'm a radio talk show host in Omaha, Nebraska. Police have searched the Omaha area but have found no trace of her whereabouts. Who placed the anonymous phone calls? If they are telling the truth, where is Judith Himes today? Did she have an abortion and die as a result? Or did she just disappear? The only possible scenario that I could see is that uh, if, in fact, uh, she is, uh, she, she didn't want the family to know about uh, the supposed abortion at the time, and she just disappeared and, in fact, has been missing for 25 years, not wanting her family to know about it. I'd like to believe that she's someplace um, and that she could be found or that she'd come back or that we'd know that she's all right. Um, I, I guess my personal theory is, is it's hard to believe that she, that she would be dead. 
Um, but I can't understand if she's alive, why she wouldn't contact somebody after all this time. After all, there's no more stigmas left. Why wouldn't she come back? In 1980, two women in Texas had a strange encounter with an unidentified object on a desolate highway outside of Houston. Within hours, it was stricken with mysterious illnesses which continue to plague them today. A genuine UFO, a military operation, or something new and unexplained. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.